Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. They're back. Illegal dumpers strike again. Tonight, we're working to track them down and talking with people in this neighborhood who have simply had enough. After nearly a year and a half, Americans can finally go to Canada for non-essential travel. But it's not as simple as just showing your passport. We'll break down what's required before you enter the country. But we're going to begin with Storm Tracker 4 and a string of severe thunderstorm warnings rolling through Metro Detroit. The first warning popped up, uh, it was around 3 o'clock this afternoon. It was a mess out there. We do want to get right over to Andrew off the top. And Andrew, are we out of the woods yet? Well, Jason and Karen, fortunately, the warnings, they've all been canceled or allowed to expire. That being said, they left some damage in their wake. And we still have some shower activity, as you can see, in St. Clair County and Sanilac County, but not as strong as earlier this afternoon. Trees reported down and power lines down these four storm reports right here that you can see near Mount Clemens, Clinton Township and parts of Macomb County. So although many of these storms have now left the area, you can see we're mostly rain free across southeast Michigan. If there are any down power lines, make sure you alert the authorities immediately. Stay away from metal fences because you never know if down wires could be touching them. Also with down tree limbs, even the possibility of down trees, it can make it difficult, of course, for drivers. So watch out for debris in the roadways. We're looking at 81 degrees right Right now, we've seen our temperatures rebound quite a bit since the storms have passed. Temperature of 81 currently, but dew points are still in the low 70s. 80s now have popped back into place in places like Howell, where it's now 84. But what about later tonight? We've got more storms on the way in your seven day forecast, and I've got the details coming up. All right, thank you, Andrew. Our other top story right now new coronavirus numbers just out this afternoon. And they aren't good. From Saturday to today, the state is reporting 2,720 new cases. That averages out to 906 cases a day. The state is also reporting eight new deaths over that three day period. For context on that, one month ago, July 9th, the seven day moving average was 159 cases per day. Today, that's up to more than 1,000. We want to bring in Dr. Frank McGeorge to get his reaction on this. And, Doc, how concerning is this? Well, you know, Karen and Jason, it's definitely not good, especially because those are the weekend numbers, which are usually on the lighter side of reality. Now, based on some of the CDC modeling data that I looked at last week, really the best we could have hoped for was some leveling off of new cases. But instead, I really think we're seeing the steady increase that we had hoped we could avoid. Unfortunately, when we've seen this pattern in the past, it's reasonable to expect transmission to just continue as long as there are susceptible people in the community. And given what we know is happening in the rest of the country, we are probably moving into another wave here in Michigan. The real question is just how quickly it's going to accelerate and how long it's going to last. And hopefully the non-weekend numbers later in the week are going to shed some more light on that. All right. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate the insight. Yeah. And here's where things stand with vaccinations right now. 63.9% of Michigan adults have received at least one vaccine dose for all the COVID concerns. School aged athletes have the green light to start practicing for fall sports starting today. And the vast majority of them will do so without masks. A decidedly different look than this time last year. Rob Maloney live this evening in West Bloomfield, where kids were out practicing today. How's it going? Well, it's going well, and this, remember, is the state champion Division I football team from last year, and they're out here practicing right now. Uh, they've been dodging the raindrops. They've been in and out. Uh, but one of the things that we're hearing from the players is they are so much happier and breathing easier because they're not wearing masks. Oh. This morning, the junior varsity took the season's first reps before the rains came. Come on, man, time, let's go. Get under control, 88. This afternoon, the varsity took the field in between the raindrops. Hey, sense of urgency, sense of urgency, let's go. Senior safety DJ Rankin excited at the prospect of breathing easier. It was hard. You have to adjust to the breathing, especially like conditioning. Conditioners got us ready with playing with the mask, but it was just, just different. After only a six game season last year, newly hired head coach Tyrese Grice is happy about the maskless practice and a full game slate. Oh man, it's tremendous uh, just to have these guys back out here to get back to normal. Uh, last year was a little challenge because we was off and on, off and on. I'm not sure we was going to have a season. The Michigan High School Athletic Association right now has no direction for schools other than to follow local county mandates. Jeff Kimmerly told Local 4 Today, considering how the numbers are heading northward, however, they are prepared for anything. 
we've had to do things like turn testing programs around in 48 hours and, and um, you know, everything else in between. So if something comes up, I, I think we'll be ready. Both the coaches and the players told us they missed out on a lot last year. Like offense and defense were split up, so like we couldn't be with like our team. Like and bonding is a main part of football. So now I want my brothers. We get after it. It's gonna make us a better football team. We're going in this year, no mass. It's, I'm excited about that. I can give them hugs now. <laughs> Now, there are a handful of districts that are saying that uh, you need to mask up on the indoor sports. That's Ann Arbor and Lansing. And there have been a couple of other counties that have now asked for indoor mask mandates. St. Clair County is one that just did this this afternoon. They didn't give clarification on whether that affects sports. So you're going to want to be checking with your school district to make sure that you know whether a mask is required indoors. In particular, we're talking about swimming and also volleyball. Back to you. Okay, swimming, volleyball, how many other sports are we talking about this fall? Well, there are nine sports altogether, the eight, eight on eight football, 11 on eight football, then there's cross country, girls golf, soccer, tennis, girls volleyball, uh, and then of course the swimming. Now with the swimming, they're saying you don't wear a mask while you're swimming, but you have to wear it on the desk, uh, on the deck rather, and also with volleyball, if you're playing, you have to be wearing a mask. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you, Rod. The University of Michigan is bringing back its indoor mask policy. Starting Wednesday, everyone on U of M property will be required to wear a face covering. The school says this will be in place for at least the first few weeks of the fall semester. Michigan is also requiring all students and staff to be fully vaccinated. Our other top story tonight, it is the day that some have waited 18 long months to see. The border between the U.S. and Canada has finally reopened to non-essential travel, but it comes with a whole bunch of new rules if you want to get across. So let's get to Priya Mann, who's live at the Ambassador Bridge tonight with how it's going on day one. Hi, Priya. Hey, Jason, you know, wait times at the border are averaging about 10 to 15 minutes, a far cry from Friday when border guards in Canada started strike action, which led to wait times topping four to five hours. Today, much smoother a day many have been waiting a very long time for. I'm very excited. My sister lives in Windsor, so she's literally 10 minutes from me, and it's been so long. <laughs> Nearly a year and a half after the U.S.-Canadian border closed due to COVID, Americans were finally able to cross land borders for non-essential travel. But it was a trickle as opposed to a tsunami of American visitors crossing at the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel Monday. You know, it's a step in the right direction, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, we, I think people are happy to, to be able to go to back to Canada if they have family over there uh, or, or uh, you know, secondary housing over there. U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents will have to show more than their passport to enter Canada. They must prove they're fully vaxxed, show documentation of a negative test result within three days before crossing, and register on the Arrive Can app. The app requires travelers have a quarantine plan and be prepared to isolate if needed even though they're vaccinated. Returning home to America, though, is the same as it was pre-pandemic. more they can be prepared by doing their homework as to what's required on both sides of the border, the better their trip will be. While it's not as simple to cross into Canada as it was before, Americans can finally shop, vacation, or visit our neighbors on the other side of the Detroit River. What's the first thing you're gonna do when you cross? Um, probably cry. <laughs> Yeah, I can certainly relate when I crossed into Canada last week, listening to Nickelback and having some poutine. You know, as for Canadians who want to come to America for non-essential travel, the border does remain closed at closure in effect till August 21st. Now, whether that's extended or lifted, we will keep you covered. Reporting live from the Ambassador Bridge, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. We listen to Nickelback here, too, uh, all the time. I, I, I know I'm speaking for some people, Priya, but I know you spoke to other <laughs> people who crossed the border today. What was it like for them? Uh, you know, we did speak to some folks who actually were turned back because they didn't have the proper documentation. So it's really important that you look and follow the rules that the Canadian government is requiring before you enter the country or you will be forced uh, to come back. And so we will hear from a lot of folks, a lot of Americans who were excited to go and who were also told they had to come back. That'll be at six tonight. I also know, Jason, you're an Alanis Morissette fan. Oh, uh, no question. I mean, how could I not be? All right, Priya, we'll see you then. New information tonight after an undercover DPD officer used deadly force after being involved in a crash. It all happened late last night on East Grand Boulevard near Milwaukee near the GM plant. Police say about 200 people and cars were drag racing and drifting right before it happened. Sean Lay just got an update from the chief on this 
Sean, what did he have to say? Karen, he says drifting and drag racing remains the number one complaint that he gets. He has undercover officers in undercover vehicles embedded in these activities and events. They're not to get involved, but he says they were forced to get involved last night. Last night's event was 200 vehicles. Interim Detroit Police Chief James White taking you inside how Detroit police try to break up the number one complaint he gets, drifting and drag racing. Around 11 p.m. last night on East Grand and Milwaukee, hundreds gathered, including undercover police who are there to observe. And when drivers break laws, they call in uniformed officers to break it up. Last night, one person drifting drifted right Right into the undercover officer's car. Our officer is kicking the door open to get out. He gets out. He sees our suspect who is uh, reaching for something at this point. He yells police. The, the suspect removes a weapon, uh, produces the weapon. He says drop it. Police say the 19 year old apparently did not drop the gun and the undercover officer shot and killed him. A very, very unfortunate and sad situation. Our officers were put uh, in a, in a life-threatening situation. Uh, they were out there doing exactly what we want them to do, regardless of how we got here, regardless of the actions. Uh, this is still someone's son, uh, perhaps uh, someone's brother, uh, and so they are obviously in mourning. So our condolences to them uh, and their family. Back here live, both of those officers in that car on leave now as the shooting is investigated. From day one, the chief told us he would be cracking down on drifting and street racing. Let's dig a little deeper and show you so far, as of August 2nd, 1,900 traffic stops as a result of this activity. 2,300 citations have been written, 103 felony arrests as a result of drink, uh, drifting and drag racing. They've recovered 76 weapons so far, but this is the first time, guys, that police uh, have gotten physically involved with drifting and drag racing to this level. Back to you. Yeah, incredible results in just a week. All right, Sean. More on the way on a Monday, including the battle over masks in schools. Tonight, with schools starting today in some states, why a patchwork of policies is causing confusion and anger across the country. Also, UN's Secretary General is calling it a code red for humanity. A new report on climate change is painting a bleak picture of the future that we might not be able to fix. And here's Hank. Trash and debris everywhere, illegal dumpers back in this neighborhood, and now police are working to track them down. I'm Hank Winchester, help me Hank, we are tracking trash live tonight.